Hi, and welcome to Socially Distanced, Technically Connected. I'm Marcy Tyler, Director of Building Science, and I'm joining you here today in Cleveland, Ohio. This is giving us that live opportunity to work with all of you on design industry challenges. What's most relevant, what we're talking about in the news, and just be able to have that dialogue together in this live setting. What's great is I'm not here alone in Cleveland. I am joined by Thanks, Marcy. I'm Paul Hugamu, and I'm the president of the Tremco Construction Products Group, which includes a lot of companies and a lot of brands all over the world. Yes, we definitely represent a lot of different companies um, right here in this room. What we're really excited about doing is being able to bring you this content on a regular basis. Okay, um, Paul. The camera here, here's our slides. Yeah, okay. far away, Marcy. <laughs> so a little technical difficulty, but we're good now. So we're, we're um, still six feet apart. We're still so six, good. six feet apart, right? So today we wanted to talk to you specifically about restoration glazing system performance. So with that, um, obviously there's a lot of different ways that we can help and work together to restore a building. And today we're focused just on glazing. What's interesting is um, from a restoration perspective, it's always um, a topic that everyone seems to engage with and it's important. Um, in many different ways. Um, it was uh, relevant even this morning as I looked at one of our industry partners, GCI Consulting posted, um, what happens to an office building's electricity's demand when almost everyone is working or stuck at home? So what they're referring to is an article by Green Tech Media. What's interesting about this article, Paul, is it talks about energy that's being used by buildings. And so the Department of Energy has shown to us that about 40% is being used by buildings. So one may think, you know, what is that being reduced to in this climate, you know, where how many people are in this building today? Well, I think there's probably 10, Marcy. Okay. <laughs> and there's usually a couple hundred. Yes. So you would think that your usage was be, would be greatly declined. And there's a variety of reasons why that's not true. Um, HVAC systems need to continue to be used because if they aren't, there could be some issues with corrosion. And you also want to keep that living condition going and monitored by keeping those on. Yeah, we, we at all times maintain uh, a really static environment in this building in terms of humidity uh, and temperature. Yeah. I think maybe in the weekends we might vary it by about five degrees because um, comfort's not as big a deal, but it's not much, Marcy. Right. And we all know that because of that usage of our buildings, um, we can help reduce that impact by making our buildings more energy efficient because if our buildings aren't leaking air and water, getting receiving water damage, those um, heating and cooling units won't be continuously running. Yeah, I think what's interesting, Marcy, is all people always think about the actual HVAC and uh, uh, air handling systems, not realizing that frequently the biggest energy issue they have with the building is really air, air loss and thermal loss. Uh, and it's got nothing to do with the mechanical systems at all. Yeah, I think it's easier to look at the mechanical systems because everything else is so much more complex. Yeah. Um, I think this was a story they always told me when we renovated this building that we're in today. Um, before it was renovated, I think your curtains might have blown or your blinds and no window was open. Yeah, there was, uh, uh, this was a classic class A office building, Marcy, from the 1960s. And we did a uh, complete uh, retrofit and upgrade uh, probably about 10 years ago. Uh, pretty dramatic effect in terms of the building performance. Rest restored it, I think, to its former Class A uh, standing um, and actually got uh, lead gold rating on a restoration, which is very, very hard uh, to right. do. And our efficiency improvements have been fantastic. And you're right, Marcy, the curtains don't move anymore. <laughs> that's, good. that's good to know. Um, as I got here today, um, as we're being um, socially responsible, I got my temperature taken, made my way into the building, and I always take the stairs and for a variety of reasons. But what I really like is as you climb the stairs here to this floor, you can see the restoration progress of how we restored this building. Yeah, on each landing, we tell a story on a storyboard uh, in terms of uh, the beginning, and then we progress all the way to the end when you're at the end, when you're at the very top. You see some fantastic pictures of our green roof and you see all of our energy results and uh, a few of our awards for the building. So it's, 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 it tells a great story and I love being able to take people on that tour. Um, 
as we all in this industry look around, we are always looking at buildings. We are looking at, you know, sealants um, and joints. We are looking at the roof to window connection. And some of us, um, as we can here, we can go out on the roof and take a look at things. So we're always seeing buildings. And in pictures like this, um, we are noticing some evidence of some deterioration. Yeah, that discoloration you see, Marcy, that's always a telltale for us of some sort of a failure, an ongoing failure going on within the joint. And uh, that for us is a great opportunity to say, hey, how can you restore that? And then really two things happen. We restore the building to its uh, original performance condition, but you get a great aesthetic upgrade. If you look at that picture you have, see the difference between the before and after? It almost looks like a new building. Yeah, so as you look at that, you can see where some of that staining and deterioration is happening on one side, and then obviously where the guys are working, that stage is where they're replacing and, and cleaning it up. Um, lots of different types of restoration opportunities. Um, this one in particular was what is called a lock strip gasket. Um, this is a type of gasket that's very difficult to bond to. So what we're looking at here is that ability to go either glass to glass or glass to whatever that facade is to make a connection. So lots of different options when we're looking at how to restore the exterior of a building. And we can even go back and restore something like this library that was built in 1895. Yeah, this one's interesting because it's uh, an architecturally significant building and we had to actually meet the requirements of maintaining that uh, architectural significance. So uh, uh, this is an old putty glaze window, right? Yep. And uh, probably had not been very energy efficient for a long time. Uh, and we were able to actually restore it to an as new condition, but in this case, probably good for at least the next 50 or 60 years. Very, very energy efficient, very custom. And I think what that speaks to Marcy is, I don't think we've ever come across uh, a glazing or a window system that we have not been able to successfully retrofit with our combination of cut gaskets, custom, custom gasketing, uh, and our high performance sealants capabilities. And so it is definitely that connection of project specific detailing and of course sealants to put it all together. Um, as we all look around at our buildings and our structures every single day, um, we see that there's so many different types of materials, glass, different types of glass, stone, metal. Um, and what we're finding out, the industry is letting us know that that building envelope failure is, is occurring within 3% of that total enclosure. That 3% of that to total enclosure is things like sealants, encodings and membranes, and that's where we can work together to help give a solution. We also all know that this continues to be a multi-billion dollar expenditure. So what we want to make sure everyone understands is we're here to help. We're not here alone. Um, the feet on our street, which we've mentioned before, over 1,200 feet on our street, and industry partners like all of you that are watching and engaging today is what really makes it um, the right fix for each individual building. Yeah. And then what we always seem to find out is it's the connections. So you will see in these segments that we're gonna be doing together is that's what we're gonna focus on is those solutions that we can provide that are due to lack of connectivity or lack of detailing or just of things that maybe have been used outside of their useful life and need to be replaced. Yeah, I think what's interesting, Marcy, is a lot of times if you have two different components and they come together, there's always a question about what's going on between them we actually go right to the interface and design systems from the interface back on out. Um, so I think it's a very, very different approach and, it, and we really want to take ownership for that interface. And that's what's difficult, I think, a lot of times is who owns it, right? So if there's a variety of different people playing in that space, that ownership is what people don't know, you know, where, who to go to. So that's where we're, we're, we're moving towards that ownership for sure. And we, and we like, to, yeah, and we like to say, Marcy, every time the word by others shows up in the specification, we'd like that to be by Tremco. We'd like to provide you a solution for sure. Um, so as we do these segments, as I mentioned, we're going to have a lot of different restoration segments. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about some membranes and coatings that we have. Um, but, but today's segment is focused on restoration and specifically the glazing. Want to make sure that everyone is aware of a lot of resources out there. Um, we do have a blog called Build Meets World, and in that we have Ken Krieger, um, one of our feet on the street out of Dallas, Texas, and he put together a blog very informative on the top nine uses of silicone extrusions in commercial construction. So you can see there, there's a skylight in that picture. So as Paul mentioned, it becomes an aesthetically pleasing solution, and it also brings things back to being air and water tight. 
The other picture there is very dramatic. It's before and after, and it just shows some of that customization in terms of colors. So I think those types of solutions, as Paul mentioned, you know, we're not turning anything away. They're very customized to what it is that you need. And I think what's interesting, just that the one skylight, the dome that you see there, of course, is over a museum. And uh, two things there, there was a, uh, a prominent building overlooking it. And so they really liked the clean aesthetics in terms of what they now overlook. And the other thing that was cool for the museum was no disruption to anything going on underneath that dome as it was uh, made watertight again. Uh, but they could continue with uh, all the artifacts underneath and all the uh, uh, remain open for traffic. And uh, so that that ability to retrofit without any disruption at all, is, it's pretty cool. That's that's huge. Um, I know we did a, um, a residential building um, a few years back and when they looked at the entire window replacement project, I think it was upwards to about $15 million. Um, we worked and we always work with obviously the installer and a design professional to help us from the uh, structural perspective. Um, and we came up with, I think it was about $900,000. Yeah. And the other thing that was interesting there, Marcy, was probably if you had retrofit the windows, you'd have disrupted the tenants floor by floor. Might have been a multi-year project and require significant staging and things of that nature. In our case, it was a project that went over a summer, a couple of guys on a swing stage, very low risk. Um, and went very, very fast. They can also work with tight weather windows. When you're doing window replacements, you usually want at least three days of clear weather. In this case, all they need is a couple of hours. They go to work, the rains come, no problem. They get off the swing stage and they come back later in the day. So that, that was, that's a significant impact, right? Because it can be done quickly and that no disruption of, of the occupants, especially for something like a residential building is, is really key. Um, we also, incorporate a lot of different types of technology. Obviously, when we're customizing these solutions and working with the consultants that we have in the industry, um, we have a design engineering team that's going to look at designing that specific gasket or um, overlay design that's going to meet the needs for your project. And we have found how 3D printing has really helped us. Here's another blog written by Brian Gagney that goes into that detailing. And it's just talking about some things like um, making sure that things get turned around much quicker and then economically so as well because now we're not doing a whole run of a gasket that may not work um, in your building. In that picture um, that, that actually shows the gasket on the left and then the actual gasket on the right so it just shows you how close they are. Um, and then Paul here's just some of those 3D gaskets of the restoration overlay that we have available. So I think we have thousands of different types of dies um, that we can utilize and we can 3D print them so that it's much quicker from a turnaround time. Too. Yeah, I think, you know, Marcy, if you go back five, seven years ago, it probably would have taken us four weeks per iteration of uh, doing the takeoff and then running a thousand feet, getting it out on the job site. And so uh, today uh, we can turn around things uh, certainly in 24 hours. And uh, it's certainly been one of my visions that everybody on this call, even today, can buy their own 3D printing capability, uh, a low-end printer, $1,000 or less. We can do all the engineering work, send you the file, and you can print it locally. So uh, there's no reason you can't do things same day. And uh, uh, what that allows us to do is, you know, probably in the past, it might have been as much as, uh, you know, four iterations, four months. Today, we can do all that work in a matter of a week or two um, and then make uh, restoration an immediate viable uh, uh, viable solution, right? Often, you know, when we come to a customer when their facade is leaking, they're in a lot of pain and they want answers right away. And uh, 3D printing today allows us to be uh, very, very viable right out of the gate. It's pretty cool. You know, when I was traveling um, in the Texas area with Blake Boone, one of our reps, that's what he started to do was engage with local printing capabilities to speed it up even that much quicker in terms of that turnaround time. So our design engineers will send out the detail, we can print it up, and then he can go right out to that job site to see how it yeah. matches up. It's still not going to be practical, Marcy. I mean, we if you were to ever see our uh, plant where we do all, all our extrusions, I don't think we're going to be printing actual tens of thousands of feet. Um, at this point, because uh, extrusion capabilities are m at much, much higher speed. 
Um, but the ability to use 3D to make sure that we have a uh, very, very quickly really dial in the geometry is absolutely critical uh, to how we uh, solve the needs of the market. As we talk about um, some of the, uh, th the case studies as we continue on through this segment, we just wanted to make sure everyone's aware of our Tremco YouTube channel. Lots of great information on there and all of the study case studies we're going to be talking about are in detail. So we mentioned um, the, the project in that residential building. That is one that is listed on there. It goes into detail. Each of the, the design professional that was involved, the installer, then, and of course our, our local um, technical rep, John Bauer, was on it. So all of those case studies are in there. Um, we also have a variety of different information in terms of our manufacturing facility, which Paul um, just touched on briefly. All the abilities to extrude different types of, of shapes all come out of our dies, and it really is that customization to what you need. Yeah, and I think the other thing, Marcy, that's been interesting for us over the last five years is a lot of people think that extrusion is sort of hasn't changed much over the years. We've innovated quite a bit in our extrusion capabilities, uh, you know, specifically if you look at our uh, our simple seal, uh, our silicone gaskets that uh, have uh, the knotty tear capabilities in them, right? So there's some pretty neat stuff happening in our plants these days uh, to enable us to do some things that people thought really weren't possible. And you, he mentioned uh, simple seal and the knotty tear capabilities and our ability to put notches into our profiles is something that's really amazing too. So we can customize where that notch is placed. It can go up and over mullions. It can go on inside and outside corners. So that's just one more level of that customization that's possible when we're looking at solutions for your buildings. Yeah, you know, we can also uh, uh, do the uh, texture, right? So yes. our goal is, uh, yeah, you got a great example yeah, right here, Marcy. There you go. So. Uh, our goal is that unless you're Marcy or I and you're a couple feet off this building and you're not looking closely, you think it's eh, it's all the same, right? So that ability to texture and color, um, you know, I think earlier we hit on that when we restore an interface or a joint, we always like it to be an aesthetic upgrade as well. So this is a good example. Um, I'll just keep going on for a second. You know, th this sort of an east uh, an surface right here, if you were to actually try to restore this normally, you'd mar the surface on either side. That's another great example of where a simple seal approach, again, gives you, without marring it, you get a nice aesthetic upgrade. Yeah, up, and, up and over instead of having to damage um, what was there. Yep. Um, another thing that we get questions on, and actually we have some questions coming in right now, um, about the line of sight. So in some of these applications, we're going glass to glass, up and over a mullion, um, as we showed in that um, uh, atrium area of that museum. Um, and a lot of times, that's the first question that people ask is, what does that line of sight look like? So this is from an actual project. Um, you can see some of the different types of extrusions that we have. We actually have a cruciform um, in one of those pictures. We have the whole building out, um, you know, an overall view of that building and then the line of sight. So it does not take away from that line of sight by very much. We're looking at a quarter of an inch or less, and it looks really nice because of the feet that are in these extrusions. Um, that are where the gasket is going to hold that sealant and apply it in just such a way so you're getting the right amount of sealant contact and it's protecting it as well as just kind of giving you a guidance for that interior sight line. Yeah, it's a really clean look, Marcy, and I think, uh, again, if you go onto the case study libraries, you're going to see some amazing before and after pictures of, uh, you know, when people have been trying to repair for years using a wet sealant. And it looks a little messy. Yeah, it's a little, um, little messy. And then you see what a cleaned up look looks like with the gasketing. It's really, a, it's, it's almost always a very significant aesthetic upgrade. And that's great, Paul. I'm glad you mentioned that because this is another case study that's on our YouTube channel. So you can go right into all the details involved in this specific project. There is a few projects we wanted to mention today. Um, please. Um, let us know. Um, reach out to us if there's something um, that you see on our YouTube channel that you want us to take a deeper dive into and talk about, especially if those consultants that are involved in those projects want to come on and join us um, in one of these live broadcasts. We would love to have that opportunity too because we'd love to hear from you and how it worked. And once again, to understand um, what those design challenges that you face every day and how we can work together to solve them. I know um, this one in particular is one of Paul's favorite that he likes to talk about? Yeah, it sure is. I, I, I remember to the day when I was approached by, it was the uh, one of our roofing sales teams, 
and uh, they thought this looked like a roof to them. And in some ways it is a roof, Marcy, but of course I very quickly realized, no, this is a glazing situation. And uh, um, so of course uh, we worked together as a team to uh, identify, you know, the right, again, glass to glass interface. Um, this is an example of a building that really leaked from the day it was built. Um, I think the design intention was good, um, but it was really until they went to our gasket overlay capability, there was no effective way to make that fully watertight. Um, and uh, uh, that's uh, in Puerto Rico, and it went through the recent hurricane, uh, one, without a leak, and two, it was a FEMA center. So it's uh, performed very, very well. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the other, you know, thing that we always like to talk about is uh, uh, the warranty situation. Um, you know, I think we, our warranties generally for these, Marcy, right, about 20 years, uh, sometimes longer. These are very high performance uh, silicones. I think they'll last way more and longer than 20 years. And we leave a lot of material behind. So uh, they have a self-perform capability to do in-house maintenance. Yeah, so that, that whole idea of leaving the linear feet behind gives you that ability to repair if you need to in an area where you need to go back up there. So you have that extra lineal feet, you can go in and very easily repair that. Um, it's funny that you mentioned the long-term um, exposure and how long these materials last. This brings us to another project profile that you can learn more about um, on our YouTube channel. And this is the Bank of America Plaza in Dallas, Texas. So once again, Ken Krieger, I mentioned him earlier. He's our feet on the street in Dallas. He worked on this project. He was the one that wrote that blog about the uses of restoration overlays. Um, this particular gasket lasted 35 years. Wow. It's so, still, and it's still ticking. So they went in and they had to do some repairs and they went in and they're utilizing a variety of different people. So we, um, I was actually driving with Ken and he showed me this building and he said he reached out to Peter Poirier, who's also featured here, um, 36 years with Tremco. So it looks like he was involved right before this gasket was made. And our design engineers went up into our resources and they found the actual drawings and details that Peter and his team had put together. And that's that one picture you can see there of the actual, some of the actual notes. So it's pretty interesting how that longevity of those gaskets is still there. So working directly with the representatives from Bank of America, with Ken Krieger, with CDC, and our partner there, Brian, um, they came up with a solution that we were able to utilize. And then we went ahead and we used um, Calvin Carter and his crew in order to do the repairs. I believe if I'm quoting Brian correctly in that video, so challenge me by watching it and see if I'm right. I think he said 80 miles of gasket wow. of our polywedge gasket is going into this building to repair it after it had lasted 35 years. Wow. So pretty incredible case study. Check it out. Um, once again, it's really interesting. And that, the animation that's in that is one of those services we like to provide because we want to make sure that everyone involved on that project knows what needs to get done in the sequencing of it. And I believe Brian goes into detail, um, Brian from CDC, about how they tried a mock-up and they noticed that in the mock-up, the gasket was just a little off. So they were able to do that in the mock-up before they went obviously onto that job site. Well, I think what's, you know, it's interesting about the 35 years, Marcy, a lot of times when we're sharing these case studies, it feels like it's new to people. And then, of course, we, we like to be able to say we've been at this a real long time. I know we're bringing more emphasis to it now, especially as there's a whole inventory of buildings that are 25, 30, 40 years old. And people think, oh, I got to reskin these, you know, or I have to tear off and replace. Uh, and restoration is really a fantastic option. But, you know, we've been at this for a long time. Some great. Just a few more to comment on. Um, like I said, go check out our YouTube, Tremco YouTube channel for a lot more of these types of videos. Um, had to mention the West Edmonton Mall. Um, that was a great um, application of our simple seal. Um, and you can see in that picture of the square footage of, of needed repairs on that Edmonton Mall. So that is the, the largest mall in Canada. Wow. So it's significantly sized. And once again, you know, we have people like Ryan Ardeal, who is your Tremco technical rep in that region who would go out and help you. Um, there was a variety of solutions tried prior to, um, and then they ended up with this solution. And once again, um, there's a variety of people that are always engaging and working um, on things like this. Yeah, we often find, Marcy, that they've been trying for years and years to try to figure out how to stop the leaks. And, uh, and I think 
it's not uncommon that we're often, uh, we, we do a test in a certain area because it's too good to be true. And, uh, but really that ability to go glass to glass with high performance sealants and uh, custom gasketing is, is, is uh, I don't think we've ever not been successful at solving a long-term problem. Just to further mention just things that are relevant in here today, as Paul mentioned, we have so many restoration opportunities as our buildings get older and older. Um, I read just this morning that that post from GCI that mentioned the article about energy use in our buildings. And then I noticed that Pat Garrity, one of our sales reps in the Kansas City area, posted or reshared something from another industry partner, and that's Foreman Ford, and that's Mike, Car Mike Carter. And he's talking about a project he's working on called Flash Flash Cube in Kansas City. So there's so many relevant um, projects. There's so much great information that we can find on LinkedIn, um, um, as well as you know just informational videos on YouTube and things like that. So I just wanted to make sure that we we mentioned that as well. Um, today specifically, the whole idea of a partnership and Trinity is I think so important. Um, the SWRI Institute, so that is the Sealant Waterproofing and Restoration Institute, has an award that they give out every year. Um, it has to include three partners to make up that trinity. So in this case, um, we received that award um, for, it was in 2018, I believe, with High Rise Repair and BECS. So that is the Building Envelope Consultants and Scientists were involved in this project. So let's take a quick look um, at what that project was. So University Tower um, was built in 1987. It's a 17-story Class A office building. It's just a shiny diamond with no other buildings around it out here off 15501 in Durham. The architecture is beautiful. The only one problem is it's always leaked like a sieve. The first time I showed up, it had stormed the night before and it had 65 leaks. Whenever it would rain high winds, we would have window leaks at just about every window in the building. Tenants' furniture would get ruined. Paperwork would get messed up. My phone would ring off the hook all day. I had a relationship with the contractor. He's been working on this building for many years. We call it leak chasing. Fixing little leaks here, little leaks there. And it finally got to a point where he needed to come up with another solution. I told him that we need to bring in an engineer. That's when I brought in BECS and introduced him to Dillwig. So they decided that Trimco would be a good partner. The solution that really became obvious was the gasket overlay that Trimco provides. The advantage to the overlay is you can bridge over the existing seal that you can make a connection from the glass to the glass, which is a huge time savings and much, much easier than trying to remove the existing wet seal. We went and did a spec area in several offices that had continuous window leaks. I followed up with one of those tenants shortly after Hurricane Irma. They responded that they were so excited and surprised that they did not have any window leaks um, and that we finally thought we had a solution that was going to work. We started with a basic type of Tremco gasket. We had many shapes that Tremco has done throughout the years, which was helpful to ultimately come up with our shape, which is an original shape. And we sent an initial sample out from a previous project, a previous uh, piece of a certain profile to the contractor, and he tried it on the wall. And we needed to make some tweaks in order to make it user friendly for him. Part of that process was the use. OK, I wanted to stop it there um, so that we could um, just start to engage. We only have about a minute left, I think. So we're going to put the camera back on Paul and I and answer some questions here. OK, <laughs> so uh, what we wanted to do today was have Mark join us from uh, BECS, and he was unable to join us for a variety of technical issues, but he sent me a quote. Um, he said, uh, we, made, we made sure we did a prototype and impact structure and worked closely with the contractor and Tremco to get that solution. So once again, he's just reiterating that partnership. Maybe we'll have Mark on on a, on a future um, segment, but um, we definitely wanted to be able to get that feedback from from him. Um, at this point, it is um, already 30 minutes in. Um, so what we thought we would answer a few questions here just so that we could get that um, uh, feedback from from what you're submitting to us. 
So what we're looking at is, you know, how do we help out with that contouring and that design? Um, so what really what we really need to do um, as, a, as a team is reach out to your individual um, tech rep. So if you have any questions on our website, you can go ahead and locate your tech rep, um, your Tremco uh, sales representative, and they'll be able to come out there. But there is certain gauges that we do recommend, and that technical rep in your region would be best to be able to help you with that. Um, there's a question up there specifically, I think, for Paul. Let's take a look at that one. It's Wayne Lloyd, Wayne Lloyd from one of our distributors. It's uh -huh. just commenting on what Paul said. So he said, it was funny to hear Paul mentioned by others. Um, I always said 20 years ago that anything specified by others would take care of it and he would convey it to Paul about systems and solutions that we can provide as a company um, partnered with Interior Supply. Tremco and Wayne are kindred spirits. Tremco and Wayne are kindred spirits. That's probably a great way for us to end our broadcast today. Um, sorry for the technical glitches. Um, I, I have a whole different uh, respect for everyone that's on TV on a regular <laughs> basis. Um, so once again, thank you everybody so much for joining us today. We're going to be doing this weekly, so and we'll be answering all your questions outside of this setting, so we will be getting back to you. Um, join us next Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern as Tremco goes live. Thank you. Thank you.